I'd like to welcome you to our Armenian Genocide in Literature event for today. My name is Laura Kartalian. I'm an instructor here in the English department. I know some of you here. And uh, we're very excited to have our two panelists for today. And I want to introduce our first panelist, who is Dr. Rubina Perumyan. And she is currently a research associate at UCLA and a former lecturer of Armenian language and literature. Having a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Cultures from UCLA, she has lectured widely and has participated in international symposia. Dr. Perumian is the author of various chapters and books and research articles in scholarly journals. Her major publications include Literary Responses to Cat Catastrophe, a comparison of the Armenian and the Jewish experience, Armenia in the sphere of relations between the Armenian Revolutionary Federation and the Bolsheviks, uh, which was written in the Armenian language and translated and published in Russian, and those who continued living in Turkey after 1915, the Armenian genocide in literature, and perceptions of those who lived through the years of calamity. Dr. Perumian's publications also include a series of textbooks in Armenian on the Armenian question for grades 10 through 12, and a comprehensive textbook of the history of Armenian education. Dr. Perumian has initiated and compiled a package of age-appropriate material, lesson plans, and teaching strategies to teach the Armenian genocide to Armenian students in grades K through 12, and has conducted workshops to introduce the material. The package has been posted on the Republic of Armenia Ministry of Education website since 2011. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Perumian. Thank you for this very generous introduction. Uh, except you did say one thing that I want to add. Um, Vahe Perumian's mother. I don't know which one is more important. He's a member of uh, your board of directors, uh, board of trustees, sorry. And uh, I don't know which one is important, being the speaker here or being the mother of uh, Vahe Perumian. <laughs> In this panel on the Armenian genocide literature, uh, I'd like to focus on the power of this literature. Armenian genocide artistic literature. The novel, the fiction, the poetry, the memoirs, the autobiographies, autobiographical novels. It is on the power of this kind of, this genre of literature that I relied to understand and to convey to my readers the huge impact of the Armenian genocide on the collective psyche of the Armenian nation and generations to come. By explicating, uh, analyzing, and presenting this kind of literature, I strove to show the world the horrendous calamity the crime that was committed against the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire during World War I. I wanted to show the ugly face of the prototype of uh, crime against humanity that inspired Raphael Lemkin to coin the word genocide. The role of the Armenian uh, uh, altogether, the role of the literature, artistic literature, in uh, understanding an event in, the, uh, in history or uh, understanding uh, a period of history is not new. We all know that after the Holocaust, at least in America, the public opinion was shaped not so much on the uh, documents and statistics that were coming from the uh, Holocaust scholarship, but it was shaped by a very slim book, The Diary of a Young Girl, and Frank's Diary. Uh, uh, Henrik van Loon who is uh, a, a historian, Dutch-American historian of the first generation, I mean, first decades of the 20th century, has attested that 
more than 40 boxes of documents and uh, statistics, figures and reports were sent to the League of Nations in support of the Armenian cause. But none of them made the uh, impact that 40 days of Musadakh made on those people. Franz Welfare's 40 days of Musadakh. I hope you have read at least that one, because that is one of the most important uh, written by non-Armenian, most important uh, uh, literature on the Armenian genocide. I'm sure that your uh, 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 library here carries it, maybe in different, in uh, uh, multiple copies. The Nazi Germany knew about this power of literature. And as soon as they came to power, they launched uh, a book burning uh, campaign. They burned in fires that they'd made in thousands of uh, uh, cities all the books that were written by Jewish writers and intellectuals. Maybe you, have, you remember the uh, movie not very long time ago, The Book Thief. It was about that, the, it showed the fires that the books were burning in it, the Jewish books were burning in it. Ironically, the uh, Turkish government in the Republican era in 1933, right after uh, France Welfare's uh, 40 Days of Musada was printed, was uh, published, uh, they followed suit. Uh, they took the example of the German Nazis and forced the Armenian population, the Armenian community of Istanbul, to renounce the book and the writer, make bonfires in the cemetery and throw the book and the images of the authors uh, uh, together with that book uh, uh, in the fire. Uh, I believe that it is in this genre of literature, in the artistic uh, uh, literature of the Armenian genocide, and not the not so much the uh, documents and factual figures and statistics, that the collective psyche of a nation that has gone through such a horrendous experience, traumatic experience as genocide is revealed. Reading the Armenian genocide literature, the artistic uh, literature, will bring down that concept, that complex concept of genocide down to the imagination of human beings because it is inspicable. It is unimaginable what happened in 1915. It is through this uh, uh, literature that we can come closer to the universal truth, which is at the roots of those factual figures and uh, statistics that come out of the Armenian genocide, uh, uh, research on Armenian genocide. In my literary uh, uh, research, when I was doing this research on the Armenian genocide, I did not need to uh, to prove the veracity of the Armenian genocide or document the Armenian genocide. The Armenian genocide was there in the writings of the memoirists, in the writings of the, uh, the literary literati that touched my heart. It is line by line, like a red string going through the literature that exists, that I have been writing about it. Today, there is a plethora of uh, 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 research done, factual documentation, historical writings, Armenian and non-Armenian historians are discovering new and new evidences to prove the Armenian genocide. That was true, a historical truth. But we have to be aware of something that may be a trap First of all, I want to say that this kind of literature is very good. It's good that it's there because by learning that literature, we can repudiate all the this nonsensical points that are thrown at us by the uh, Turkish government, by the uh, Turkish and pro-Turkish uh, historians and uh, uh, diplomats. 
but I guess they are keeping us on the web, trapped in the web of proving and reproving again and again something that has been proven a hundred times. This is uh, keeping us back. This is keeping us from rallying around our cause, behind our cause, to see what is the next step after the recognition of the Armenian genocide, which to me is not that important. But after Turkey said, okay, we recognize that what happened was genocide, what next? What are the implications, historical, economical, political implications of uh, uh, the next step? Uh, I want to talk about uh, my scholarship on genocide literature a little bit. My first book, uh, the, as it was said, uh, uh, the literary responses to catastrophe, uh, a comparison of the Jewish and Armenian experience, was actually uh, in, uh, it was published in 1993, and it was actually the elaboration and elaboration of my dissertation that I turned it at UCLA uh, in 1989. In this book, I try to, uh, to provide a context, a historical context, of the history of these two peoples, history full of persecutions of these people, these two people. I tried to follow the paradigm of responses in their rupture, in their continuum, when responding to the, uh, uh, to the contemporary disaster, national disaster. I compared the responses of the first generation Armenian writers and first generation Jewish writers to genocide and Holocaust. So to see the parallels, the disparities. And by the way, I should say that to me, the Armenian genocide literature is not limited to the uh, literature that was produced right after the genocide, I mean, uh, right after, after 1915. And uh, does not end by the first generation writers, the literature of the first generation writers. Just like the Armenian genocide is not limited to the war years, 1915, 1918, as it is sometimes uh, said, but it expands, expands back, back into the uh, massacres of 1894-96, the uh, uh, massacres of uh, Cilicia, 1909, the deportations and massacres of uh, 1915 to 1923, and continues today. After this book was published, I uh, continued working on the diaspora in Armenian literature uh, uh, to expand my scope. I also did some research and uh, presented papers on the Soviet Armenian literature, especially the first decades after Sovietization. How was this topic of the Armenian genocide uh, creeping into the literature? Because talking about the Armenian genocide, writing about the Armenian genocide was forbidden, was a taboo. You couldn't do that. How did this topic pop creep into the literature, and the historical memory perpetuated in the Armenian home in Soviet Armenia, and still is today. But I was always curious to know, what about Turkey? What about the Armenians who lived, continued living in Turkey? Armenians, the Armenian community of uh, Istanbul, Armenians within uh, the uh, uh, Turkish Republic, uh, in the inland, there were some, not, not very much left now, Armenians who were forced to convert to Islam, those who were true Islams, those who were practicing uh, Christianity in secret, the hidden Armenians. How did they feel about their Armenianness? Were they able to maintain their identity, their ethnic identity, or they were gone completely? This was not possible. There was no uh, uh, information on them. 
and uh, the Turkish Armenian uh, 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 literature did not help much. It was another taboo in Turkey to speak about the Armenian issue, to uh, speak the, uh, about the Armenian presence, not in the, uh, uh, the uh, Turkish media and not in Armenian media. It was prohibited. You couldn't do that. But things changed. The government had to outpour a series of den de denialist literature. And then there were the progressive writers, like Kemal Yalçin, one of the first, and Elif Shafak, and uh, Orhan Pamuk. And uh, I, I'm not talking about uh, Fethiye Çetin, who was half Armenian, or one-fourth Armenian, and uh, 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 Hrant Dink, who was Armenian. These people, these progressive intellectuals, began to look into the past for their own sake, to find, to search for their own identity, because they wanted to reject the identity that was imposed on them by the Turkish government. And by doing that, they came face to face with the Armenian issue, with the Armenian presence before the Republic and their contribution within uh, the culture, the Turkish, the Ottoman culture. I wrote a paper on that and presented it in 2006 uh, during a Middle Eastern Studies Association conference. It was in Washington. And it was a very interesting panel because we had two lady scholars, Turkish scholars, speaking on behalf of the Armenian genocide and the perception of it in Turkey. Ironically, just two months after that, Hrant Dink was assassinated. I'm sure you know about who Hrant Dink is. That assassination really shook the world. I was shaken too. I left everything that I was doing on the diaspora literature and turned into going deeper into this uh, Turkish-Armenian relationship and Turkish-Armenian uh, responses to, to their predicament. The result was another book, uh, the continuation of the first one, or rather that it stands alone, which is the, uh, and those who continued living in Turkey after 1915, the metamorphosis of the, uh, uh, the Armenian post-genocide identity as reflected in the artistic literature. In the, uh, my most recent book, which I hope is not, is not the last one, because I'm working very hard day and night on the continuation of this, on the second generation. Uh, and I'm hoping that to publish that during this year of the centennial, to dedicate it to the centennial of the Armenian genocide. In this book, I started to expand my scope to take more and more uh, uh, first generation writers to see what they think about their their experience. How do they respond to their, their own traumatic experience? They were survivors. I also took some memoirs. And these memoirs, just written by uh, ordinary men and women, mostly in their old age, mostly by the encouragement of their uh, uh, children and grandchildren. It was amazing to see the details, the uh, details on places, on uh, uh, dates, names. Everything was in it just like if it was just it had happened yesterday. Psychologists call this hypermnesia as opposed to amnesia. Psychologists have uh, uh, researched this, and there is uh, uh, a psychologist by the name of Judith Lewis Herman that says that moment, moments and images are permanently encoded in the writer's mind. They uh, always are there in the minds of survivors of a great catastrophe. No matter how hard they, uh, they tried to uh, subdue the tormenting memoirs uh, of their traumatic past, a slight sight, a, 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 a smell, a sound, albeit with no particular significance in normal life, uh, uh, awakens in them the tragic scenes they have lived. 
uh, uh, they call this the vulnerability of the Armenian genocide survivors. And Mar Marianne McCarty Mesropian, she's an Armenian psychologist, explains that tragic scenes in the past experience form iconic images which stay deep in our consciousness and pop out with a slight association with real life occurrences and take us back to the time when that tragic event occurred. It is not easy to read these this stories. This macabre scenes of looting, uh, rape, the unspeakable orgies of Turkish officers <coughs> feasting on uh, Armenian maidens. Uh, can you leave you distressed? This is how I feel about the, uh, the genocide literature that I read, that I've worked with for about 30 years. Before my eyes and etched in my mind is a map of places of thriving Armenian villages Thin lines of people wobbling along, covered in dust and filth, makeshift tents, that is, rags on wooden sticks, that is, concentration camps, impassable gorges, open mass grave sites with, in, uh, with unburied corpses scattered around, little boys and girls starving and sick, curled up on dirty street corners. The horrifying landscape covers the entire Ottoman Empire from east to west north to south. I know a map with red dots, large and small, showing the places where massacres occurred. But these dots do not speak the language of pain and suffering that I read in the literature of atrocity. They do not represent all the places, the towns and villages where the deportees passed, leaving their dead behind. The red dots on the map of my mind are moving. They begin to walk the dead march and cover the entire country. Turkey is painted in red, the color of Armenian blood. That is what the Armenian genocide is. That is what the Armenian genocide has done to Turkey. It is not easy to read all this story, but I believe that this literature is the most meaningful monument uh, in the memory of the Armenian genocide. It is the most meaningful, the most strongest uh, monument against forgetting. We should not forget. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about an autobiographer, uh, Levon Zavan Surmelian. Uh, his autobiography stands out, really. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, this is another book that I recommend you to, to read. He was uh, one of the orphans. He was only 16 years old when he came to United States. Without a penny in his pocket, without the language uh, uh, to, to make him go around in United States. But he made it to the top. He was an English... Uh, 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 language and literature professor, university professor, and he was a very sought for, very important writer. But he was never happy in this, uh, in this world. He always thought of himself as, as, an, as someone in exile. In one of these paragraphs, he, he has these paragraphs, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, in one, uh, at the end of his uh, autobiography, one of the paragraphs says, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what can you do on New Year's Eve in free and happy America when your playmates and schoolmates, the kids you grew up with, your companion in grief and joy, in hunger and misery, are gone, lost, when the pretty girls you loved in kindergarten and grade school are dead, their bones lie unburied, or they are in captivity, forgotten by, the, by their own nation. We cannot forget. Forgive and forget. This is what people are preaching on us as a civilized solution to our cause. But forget what? How can you forget a magnitude, uh, a, a catastrophe of that magnitude? 
the Jews have not forgotten, even though Germany was apologetic and made compensations. How can you forgive? And who do you feel forgive? The perpetrator who does not even acknowledge the crime? Healing and reconciliation, it is preaching on us. Healing and reconciliation is not possible with these conditions. It will be possible only when the both, both sides, the victims and the victimizers engage without the package, without the, the baggage, I would say, of baseless claims that the Turkish government is doing today, intensifying today because of the apprehension of the uh, uh, centennial coming up. And until that such date, I'm sure that as Mar uh, De Canio says, Margaret De Canio says, time cannot quench the bitterness of memories. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karamian, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, before I introduce our next speaker, I want to let you know that there will be some handouts going around that list a series of books that have been recommended to you by Professor Oshin Keshishian. And uh, at the end of the presentation today, we will also have a few minutes left for Q&A. Um, so next, I wanted to introduce our second speaker, Professor Oshin Keshishian who was born in Jerusalem and came to America in 1956. He served two years in the U.S. Army and graduated from Cal State University of Los Angeles with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and the University of Laverne with a Master's of Education in Bilingual Education and Counseling. Professor Keshishian has been the publisher and editor of the Armenian Observer English Language Weekly since 1969. He headed the delegation which took writer William Sadoyan's ashes to Armenia in 1982. He has been a leading member of various organizations, including the Los Angeles City Hollywood Redevelopment Agency, and was a founding member of the Armenian Assembly of America and the Diknanyan Armenian Day School. Professor Kishishian edited a book on writer Hagop Karapens and has published a book on writer Stepan Alajajian. He has written over 100 scholarly papers and has participated in over 30 scholarly conferences around the world, including Johannesburg, South Africa. He has been invited to the White House three times. <coughs> He has been a lecturer at Cal State University Northridge and an adjunct professor at University of Laverne and Los Angeles City College. He was one of the five founding members of the Armenian Martyrs Monument in Montebello in 1965 and has been serving on the committee of the Genocide Monument for the past 50 years. Professor Keshishian has taught Armenian language and has been a faculty member at Glendale Community College for 30 years. So please now join me in welcoming Professor Oshin Keshishan. Thank you very much, Lara. I've known Lara for, uh, well, I wouldn't say how many years. She's a little girl, we're family friends, and I'm so glad she teaches here. Uh, I don't know why Glenda College keeps you for 30 years. Uh, I don't know, I should retire one of these days, but we'll see. I would like to really thank Dr. Weyer and the board for organizing the centennial to let people know what's going on. And uh, I'm glad uh, I had that I have a different approach than Dr. Pirubi, unfortunately, so we don't repeat each other. Uh, I have, I'm not a complete person, actually. I am 99% normal, like not a human being like most people, because I've never seen my grandfather or grandmother. So my dad was an orphan. So grandpa never took me to school. He never put me on a bicycle. So I was denied that pleasure of having a grandfather buy me ice cream, 
put me on a bicycle, everything. But we survived, fortunately. And after the war from Palestine, Palestine, we came to America, and here we are. It is interesting that we live in America, yet the American government has not accepted the Armenian genocide. And a good friend of mine from England, he published four volumes of American documents from Morgenthau on about the Armenian genocide. We have 3,000 documents in America that tells you there was a genocide, yet the government doesn't talk about it, doesn't accept it because of political expediency, as you know. And I should say that there are about 30, 40 countries accepted genocide. And when I was invited to the White House, I asked President Reagan for the first time, how come America doesn't recognize the Armenian genocide? So he was flabbergasted. Uh, I said, which genocide? I said, Armenian and Turkish. He said, oh, he said, we should sit down with new people and discuss that issue. That was covered, fortunately, in Washington Post, New York Times, and other papers. So it's amazing that they don't really, really recognize with having all those records, President Wilson and so many, so many, so many. Now, I was given 15 minutes to talk and usually if I don't read, I talk long, just like all teachers. <laughs> so I, just, I wrote a little bit so I can, uh, you know, maybe read it. The Armenian genocide planned and perpetrated by the Ottoman government is a well-known, very sad fact. But the Turkish government has been denying it for a century. There are thousands and thousands of documents and books, reports, eyewitness accounts to prove the veracity of the genocide. All the foreign embassies in Turkey, they have and they should and they did. They send their reports to their governments. That's why we have such a huge 3,000 page document sent by, from Turkey by the American consulate to the Washington to State Department. American missionaries have published scores and scores of books. The French, the Dutch, Japan, Arab countries, Russia, China, as well as South American countries, have published articles and photos about the genocide. It's all over the world, even China. They even helped the nearest relief when America started a relief agency to help the orphans and the destitute people. Now, Turkish historians and some civic leaders are standing tall, like you was mentioned, and recounting their country's guilt in organizing the genocide of the Armenians. In literature, the Armenians have published many books, as you heard from Dr. Pirumian and her books. I will summarize a little bit of what has been written, and a list of books is available at the end, or they gave it to you. Now, in general, American writers wrote very little about genocide, just passing, you know. D.H. Lawrence wrote Mother and Daughter in 1929. It's a great short story. He says he had fought and won and lost and was fighting again, always at a disadvantage, giving an analogy with the Armenian. Ernest Hemingway, when he worked for a Toronto newspaper, he wrote stories about Smyrna, 1922, when it just burned the whole city. Many books have been written by American admirals and all that. John Dos Passos, very well-known writer. He wrote in Orient Express, published in 1922, when he was a new writer, about the killing, the starvation, and exile of the Armenians in Turkey, and mentions this Armenian friend, whose quotation, mother, father, and three sisters were cut up into little pieces before his eyes. Similarly, my dad has seen his father's being killed right in Marash in 1921. And uh, a lot of items. Elgin Grosklos, an American missionary, now he wrote a lot of books also. Arthur Kessler, a famous writer, in his The Age of Longing, described the massacres in the city of Urfa. 
particularly burning of the people who were hiding in the cathedral, taking refuge, and talking about the Hungarian Social Democratic Party fighting for an independent Armenia, they burned the whole cathedral and over 200 people died instantly. Lagir was mentioned uh, by Rupina Pirumian, 40 Days of Musata. This is an iconic book, a very important book, and uh, like she said, I would mention to try to get the book and read. It was 900 pages, but now they summarize it into about 500 pages. So, but that tells you everything. One of the most important novels of, on the Armenian genocide, 40 Days of Musata, 40 Days of Mountain Musa, written by renowned Austrian author Franz Werfel, a poet and a novelist. The book was planned to be written in 1929 when Werfel, who served in the Austro-Hungarian army, was in the Middle East. The book, published in 1933 in German, drew the attention of the public, particularly in Europe. It was considered a masterpiece by literary critics, and the following year, an English translation of the book came out. The novel depicts in detail the brutal and systematic killings of the army based on documents relating to the planned massacres by the three leaders of the Ottoman Empire, Jamal Pasha, Enver Bey, and Talat. Now, Jamal's, interesting, Jamal's grandson went to Armenia last year. The grandson, whose grandfather was one of the organizers of the killing, and he did mention that his grandfather was guilty, but not very guilty, because he was uh, the governor of Aleppo, and the other two were the real guilty people. He also came to LA, spoke at UCLA, and 2,000 people were present at his talk. The grandson of the organizer of the massacre. Now, he changed a little bit, and he put a, uh, Read on the Armenian Memorial in Yerevan. Uh, welfare, uh, uh, Franz Werfel actually had a lot of problems in Europe, and then eventually he came to California in Los Angeles, lived in Beverly Hills, and he died uh, in 1940. Now, important events surrounded the novel, especially, this is very important, when MGM wanted to make a movie based on the book for Ziza Musada with Clark Gable to play the major role. My God, what a film would that be? <laughs> However, the Turkish ambassador in Washington fought hard to stop this production, pressuring the United States State Department politically. After years of fighting, MGM's president, Mr. Myers, gave up the idea. Later on, others wanted to make the movie, but MGM had the rights until 1970. Then, a good friend of mine, Sarki Muradyan, made a film, uh, it was amateurish, but anyhow, it's a film. But let me tell you, believe it or not, in 2006, we met with uh, Sylvester Stallone, and he wanted to make a movie on Four Days of Musata. Then he found out all the problems he had, they had MGM, he changed his mind again. So the pressure by the government of Turkey is a lot. However, You've seen the movie, maybe America, America, by Elia Kazan, a Greek who was born in Istanbul, and he came to America, and he made this film, America, America, and it describes the killings of Greeks and Armenians and Kurds. And uh, he was on the blacklist for a while as a communist, but then eventually he made the film, America, America, and he won several awards. After arriving in New York, the hero of the book goes to the Statue of Liberty and feels he has made the right decision seeing many people in the harbor using the negative tongue, native tongue. He eventually makes a few dollars and finds a way to bring his relatives to the U.S., including Elia Kazak, the hero's uncle, who became one of the most famous filmmakers and passed away in 2003. He had a lot of pressure from everywhere. Now, we spoke about Fitia Chetin. Now, I, being on the Arbidi Monument, organizing founding members of Montebello, I was refused visa to go to Turkey several times because 
you know, the committee. So finally, two years ago, I did go to Turkey. And in Istanbul, the American consul, uh, Christine Tomlinson, a very nice lady, she told me that, look, for five days, the Secret Service is going to follow you, but don't worry. And you start sweating, of course. <laughs> Uh, he says, she said, go to a coffee shop and just talk. So I went to a coffee shop and they came, two of them. So I gave him my card. I said, hi, this is my business card. I'm a reporter, you're looking for me. He took the card, put it in his pocket. Then I said, how about you? Don't you have a card? I spoke in Turkish. I speak Turkish. And he says, well, you know, I'm the Secret Service. I can't give you my card. And he left. Four days, they came. But there's another interesting thing, I, nothing to do with the literature, but it's good to know. Uh, they wanted me to be on TRT television station, Turkish radio television. They came to Glendale 10 years ago. They took a little uh, interview about me, with me. And when I told the guy, I said, look, I don't know anything about Armenia, Turkey. And then the guy says, Secret Service for Ahmed. He says, nah, he says, we know you've been to Armenia 34 times. I was sweating. And he said, why are you sweating? I said, I'm sweating because what kind of a secret service man are you? I've been to Armenia 41 times. <laughs> but he said something else, he sweat more. He said, we didn't count the Soviet trips. So Turkish government is on the ball, really. Now in Istanbul, I met this lady, like she mentioned, Fethiye Çetin, who wrote a book, My Grandmother. And she didn't know she was Armenian until age 50. When a grandmother tells her, Fethiye, by the way, do you know, uh, we are actually Armenians. And I was interviewing her in Istanbul, and she didn't speak English or French, only Turkish. So I said, what happened to you when your mom, uh, grandma says that well, you are Armenian, not Turk? She says, I fell on the ground. I don't even know when I woke up. So now she is defending uh, Haram Dink, the assassinated reporter, uh, editor, and she's written another book now, uh, The Grandmothers. So they are coming out and writing. There are many, many other books also by Turkish writers who write. Now she mentioned Elif Shafak, and I'm going to, I left these two short uh, talk about the two people. Elif Shafak uh, wrote The Bastard of Istanbul, a book. She's about 40 years old. She has a PhD in social sciences. She taught at the uh, University of uh, Arizona. And she came to UCLA for a conference. And with Richard Avanis and I and two other people, we went to lunch with her. And we said, Jesus, how come you wrote this novel, The Bastard of Istanbul? about Turkey when you're from Turkey. And she said something that has not been written yet, no, nowhere, but I'm telling you because it's really, really uh, mind-boggling. She said that she was born in France, by the way, she's not born in Turkey, because her mother was a consul general in France. So she said the Armenian secret army for the liberation of Armenia, Asala, who had killed more than 30 Turkish officials, wanted to kill her mother too. And she was surprised, she was young, 14 year old girl. She said, my mom is nice, why would they want to kill her? And her friend, French friend, gives her a book on genocide. Now she reads the book, she says, oh, she says, my God, what have we done to these Armenians? And that's why she wrote this book uh, about uh, the bastards of Istanbul. She was harassed by the government many, many, many times. She had threatening uh, letters, emails, and I told her, don't send me an email anymore because I may be into trouble too, you know, talking to them. So we didn't, so she stopped. Similarly, Orhan Pamuk mentioned, he was also uh, was convicted to go to jail for uh, three years because the Turks have a rule they call it the uh, law 301, which means you insult Turkishness. So if you were the word genocide, boom, you go to jail without even having a court session. 
But now things are changing a little bit. Again, imagine, despite all the agony she had gone through, Elif Shafak, she wrote the book in defense of the Armenian people. And she mentions, especially she defends Armenian women's rights in the book. Her book has been published more than 15 languages, including Armenian. Now, another interesting character, maybe some uh, Spanish-speaking people there, no, Jose Antonio Guriaran. This guy is a very well-known person. He's Spain, from Madrid, Spain. He, was, uh, he worked for the newspaper uh, Lo Pueblo, People. He was in Madrid, December 8, 1980, talking to his wife on the telephone to go to take her to a coffee shop. And then all of a sudden, two bombs explode right there and then. And uh, nobody died, but he is one of the 10 people that get hurt. Now, she's gone to the hospital, and they tried to save his legs. Fortunately, he was saved. Now he walks with a cane. Uh, one leg is still damaged. But in the hospital, he wants to know who put this bomb. And he found out the Armenian Secret Army of Liberation of Armenia, Asala, had put the bomb. Now, despite the fact that he could barely walk, he went to Lebanon, interviewed the Asala leaders, and wrote this book, La Bomba, La Bomba, about the Armenian genocide. Now, the guy is walking, limping, yet, because he's such a strong man, such a powerful guy, he's written this book, defending Armenian rights, speaking about the genocide, and also telling the Asala to be like Martin Luther King, to be more peaceful than start killing people. And yes, this man who could have lost his legs and even his life, instead of complaining and taking action against the group, he wrote the book, published in 82. It received very wide reviews and it's been translated to 20 languages. And this Antonio Gurian and Jose Gurian also came to Los Angeles about 15 years ago. And we gave a little reception for him. There was nobody there was there that didn't kiss the guy's forehead. I mean, they're going to kill him, yet he writes a book about the people who are going to kill him. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable thing. Now, all these things happen, yet uh, we have survived as Armenians, and we have contributed to American society. We have done. I'm glad that a book by uh, Nancy Krikori and Zabel is a textbook in English, ESL 146 reading, and that's about the genocide also. And they've been reading that book for a couple of years or more than that. But uh, we have done a lot to this country and other countries wherever we went. The car transmission, automatic transmission, by the way, is invented by an Armenian, Oscar Banker. His name is Oscar Sarafian. Saraf means a banker. He changed his name. Ford was stealing his patent. He sued them. He got $2 million. So I was late somewhere one time. He says, how come you're late? I said, don't blame me. Blame Oscar Banker. He didn't fix. He didn't do a good job with creating the transmission, also with helicopter transmission. Uh, when you wash your hand, your face, when there's one faucet, whole cup, hot and cold water come from the same faucet. That's invented by Mr. Alec Manukian in Michigan, and big creation, he's a millionaire. Uh, when you drink uh, Coke, sometimes the straw is tall and you can't drink it. Now there's a straw that you bend it. That straw is invented by Ardashes Aikanya, lives in Orange County, he retired in 50 years old. He makes billions. <laughs> so we've done a lot to this country. <laughs> uh, despite all those, uh, everywhere. You can't even think the credit card, ATMs, is invented by Arthur Simjian, an Armenian guy in New York. So now everybody uses now. So every time I use it, I think of Arthur, good guy. What he did so we, it makes our life easy. 
And there's so many, so many, so many other things. And let me tell you one more thing. Oh, $20. The green and the black color on the Armenian dollar bill is invented by an Armenian, Christopher de Seropia. They gave him they uh, patent, they gave him five thousand dollars in eighteen eighty five. Send him back to Turkey. He was a pharmacist. But I don't like him because you cannot imitate this. You get caught. <laughs> I wish he didn't do it. <laughs> and like uh, <clears throat> William Sarian says in his uh, one of his books, try to kill these people, you sons of <laughs> try to kill them. You cannot, because when two of them meet together, they will create a new Armenia. Thank you very much. The, uh, the list gives all the names of the books that's written by Americans and Armenians, so that I didn't talk about them, so that you can read them. Thank you, Professor Kashishian. Uh, so we have a few minutes now for any questions for our presenters. Yes? As uh, Professor Kishishan said, uh, there is a huge Armenian diaspora living uh, in such a politically uh, powerful countries as Russia, France, United States. However, uh, as we know, the political importance of Turkey is very strong on the international arena. And then uh, these hundred years of denial is mostly related to political and economical interests, more than human. Uh, and then we also know that California, since it's establishing, uh, posed itself as a progressive state state with many prestigious universities, so which tells us that uh, one of our main values uh, as progressive people of California is knowledge. Um, uh, however, recently, uh, Hollywood and one of its favorite actors, Russell Crowe, com comes up with, uh, with the film, it's called Water Divine, where he strangely exaggerates or hides some uh, point of Turkey's past. With uh, this film that has its release and wide distribution around the world during the hundred years of uh, after genocide, do you consider Hollywood and California itself is under the threat to lose uh, its main idea and status of being progressive in many decisions of uh, human nature? Well, what's the question? <laughs> do you consider Hollywood and California itself is under the threat? Uh, to lose its an idea of being and status of being a progressive state? Well, there are two sides of the story. And by the way, let me tell you, uh, in Hollywood, Western and Hollywood Boulevard Corner is going to be dedicated next week and be called Armenian Genocide Square. The city council approved it. So there are naturally reactions to it. Also last week, uh, the LA City Council, there's only one Armenian on the council, and he can't control it. The City Council wrote a letter to President Obama to accept the genocide as a democratic person, particularly when he was not the president, he did mention that there was a genocide. So there will always be opposing views, reactions, just like in Turkey. I mean, who thinks that Turks are going to write books about the genocide, you know? So it happens, but we have to be alert, or American uh, police and uh, responsible individuals should be alert to stop those things. That's the only thing we can do, nothing else. But at the same time, next Monday, there will be a new film in the Egyptian theater, 1915, made by Gary Noanesian. So we're making films too, and they're making films too. They will. I mean, this is something uh, you can't stop. It's a freedom, free country, and all that, you know. I, Arthur. I've been, uh, I've been writing poetry about the genocide, uh -huh. but I want to go more in depth with, uh, with the poetry. And uh, which one of these books would be best for that? To publish? Yeah, just to inspire more writing, more in depth. Well, no, you should send it to uh, 
poetry magazine. It, uh, it comes out every three months, and especially it got a young and new name, poetry. We have it in the library, and there's American Poetry, another magazine uh, which publishes poetry, especially by young people. Our college has one too, a book in the beginning, but that's only one time a year. So you don't print yours and somebody else's, and it's the book is over already. Uh, but keep writing. If you think I can print it, if you want in my paper, but uh, uh, because daily papers don't publish poetry, you know it has to go in magazines, journals, poetry magazine, maybe uh, other magazines, you know. But continue writing. Just a comment. I um, I've noticed. I know some of you already know, but if you don't, uh, the um, Central Library in Glendale has an Armenian section, uh, books written in Armenian or or about Armenia, and also Barnes & Noble in um, uh, the Americana, they have an Armenian section. So if you didn't know, just go and browse there and, and look up some books there. Yes, Barnes & Noble. Yeah, so there are, there are many books today, many articles, like the one of Ahmed Ansar about the Armenian Tapu, uh, Ahmed Altan, my Akhbari, Akhbari, my brother, uh, that is uh, an article, and many, many other articles of uh, Omid Kud, Omid Kardash, all those blows in, in, in the category of uh, genocide literature. I mean, of course, you, the ones you mentioned, of Elif Shabat and Hanar Jam and Fatia I mean, there are, now let's say, uh, tens of them, and maybe hundreds of, of articles. Well, in literature, not that much. Non-fiction, there's thousands and thousands of books, you know. By the way, instead of answering him, I'm going to tell him who he is. He's going to publish a book this year on all the Turkish writers who write about the genocide and they are being harassed by the Turkish government. So see, he's going to publish an 80-page book. I wrote a little introduction and Levon Marslian also wrote the introduction. So he's been a scholar and doing work, and uh, I'm glad you're doing your part in trying to uh, see that genocide is recognized. Urish, that's it. Thank you. Thank you again to Dr. Perumian and also Professor Kiyashishian and uh, thank you to all of you for joining us.